We ain't doing so hot. Oh, it's better than it was. Yeah. All right. Moving on up. Amen. We got to give to the kingdom. Amen. <clears throat> well, there ain't nothing worse than trying to talk about giving, teach about giving during a tough time. Amen. I, I'm aware of that. But I'm also aware that tough times ain't never held back the blessings of the Lord. Never. Never. I've told you all before, I've wrote hot checks and put them in the offering before. Somehow or the other, they didn't end up being hot when I got through with them. I'm, I'm not normally afraid. I'm not, I'm not afraid. That's not a good term. Uh, I approach this message today with some trepidation uh, because I'm not exactly sure. Uh, well, I tell you the truth, I don't know how none of them is going to be received. Because sometimes I think I'm going to preach something and they're going to run the aisles and jump, holler, and yell. And that Brother Chris had to fight to keep them awake. And then sometimes I think, Lord, I better hurry through this one so they get on out of here. And everybody says it's the best thing they ever heard in their life. So it ain't up to me to decide how y'all going to respond. Amen. But it's the word of the Lord. He won't leave me alone. Bothered me all night long last night, all day yesterday, for the last several days. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best to deliver you what the Lord has given to me for you. Um, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 24. How many of you realize, recognize, and accept that the church marches to the beat of a different drummer than the world does? Amen. Y'all go ahead and stand for me to read the word. Amen. We normally don't do that on Sunday mornings, but it's a good idea. It's an honor for the Word of God, not for me. Amen. And uh, I can show you in the book where they stood up at 6 o'clock in the morning and didn't sit down till dinner time. That's noon hour. Six hours they stood up and listened to Ezra read the Word of the Lord. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And you may be seated. I want to preach to you to, for you. Let's start all over. I want to minister to you for a few minutes this morning on the subject, the lost art of friendship. Webster defines friends. <laughs> this is almost funny. It's almost funny. Amen. A person you know well and like. That's a definition in Webster's Dictionary of a friend. A person you know well and like. I'm going to let y'all try to get that. I saw a sign one time that said a friend is a person that knows everything there is to know about you and likes you anyway. Friendly is defined by Webster's as like a friend, helpful or kind. Dictionary.com, which I happen to like these days, everything that's beneficial seems like it's got a .com on the end of it. Friend is a person attached to another by feelings of affection or personal regard. And friendly is the characteristic of or befitting a friend. In the Bible, the Old Testament primary word for friend is rea, R-E-A. Which means friend, companion, or fellow. In the New Testament, there's two primary words used for friend. Philos or philos, which means loved, dear, or friendly. And then hetairos, which means a comrade, a companion, or a partner. Now to talk about friendship is in fact a very polarizing subject. Meaning that people stand on far different ends of the spectrum as to what they define as a friend. And there's a difference in having a friend and in being a friend. And there are many ideas about what a friend is. I begin to think about how you get friends. And 
There's a lot of our friends that have been forced on us. Circumstances, geography, you automatically seem like we're drawn to the neighborhood group of kids who happen to live around you when we were coming up. Some of your friends are inherited because your daddy was friends with their daddy. You automatically got to be friends with them, right? And then, of course, there's the family deal, which tends to force some friends on you. I heard somebody say one time, you don't choose your family, but you choose your friends. Unfortunately, if you don't have a lot of people live around you, your family is your best friends. And I'm happy to say that that is the case with me. And then there are those that you just, for whatever reason, and this is pitiful to me, I've been there before. And Brother David, when I think about it in hindsight, I'm ashamed of myself. But there are those that we want to be friends with. Don't really know why. Except maybe somebody else is. Or it's cool to be friends with them. You don't even know if you like them. But because somebody else does, you want to be friends with them. There's an ideology which I have somewhat compiled myself. And, and it's hopefully going to lead us to a, a destination this morning. And open a revelation of the desire that God has with regard to friendship both with Him and our friendships with others. But the prevailing thought that I want to explore this morning and, and maybe be able to paint a picture with words, and I understand that this could be to my own detriment, because all of us, for whatever reason, all of us feel like that we are an expert when it comes to picking friends. The ones I picked are the best ones. And we've got to understand and recognize the effect that friendship has on us. Uh, even to the point that your mama may not like what friends you run around with because when you're with them, you tend to do things you shouldn't do simply as a matter of friendship. Many will be this morning too proud are too oblivious to accept this as a viable church issue or at least try to lay the blame elsewhere. We tend to search when it comes to friendship until we find people that like the same things as us. Possibly that they dress similar to us. Same entertainment choices. Sometimes dislikes bind us together. And the list could go on and on. But the point is, we then pick them as a friend. We gravitate toward them because it suits us or because it's safe. In some cases, we're attracted to them. In a platonic manner, of course. Understand, this has no sexual undertones. But we are attracted to a, a particular individual or a group of individuals. How many of you have ever read or heard, we, we like that it has such a negative connotation and, and, and especially as portrayed in books and in movies and, and in the media. And I'm in no way, in no way at all uh, uh, an advocate of doing this. Uh, but how many of you have ever read why it is that people join a gang? They, they do it for friendship. They do it because it's safe. They do it for... It's, it's, all of those things go together. They don't do it because that they want to be bad to people. They don't do it because they want to do drive-by shootings. They don't do it because they want to steal. They do it primarily because of the relationship that, that is accompanied by it. But we are attracted to a situation... Attracted to a group of people and we change ourselves to accommodate their likes, their dislikes, their hobbies, their hairstyles, and other friends. I want you to think about the last time you were at the mall in the middle of the summertime and there's this young crew that comes cruising down the mall and there will at the very least be a common feeling amongst them, but most usually there will be an evidence, uh, outward evidence that says uh, they all belong together. You agree? But the end result is friendship. You've seen it before. Six or eight or ten or twelve or three or four, two, 
Girls will get together and they'll all decide to fix their hair the exact same way. Same little braid down the side or maybe the same, you know, homemade color treatment or whatever they might put on it. And, and they'll all want to go out and be together. I, I remember one time, and, and I'm, not, I'm not proud of this either because I, I've been susceptible to the same things. And, and sometimes I try to put on a, a particular kind of front. But the truth of the matter is, I like friends and I like friendship. And, and I like uh, having relationships with people. But I remember... I remember one time that I was with a group of guys and, and we were we were very young, way too young for me to even tell you how young we were, and they had all got liquored up. And they were acting goofy. Now you have to understand something. I wasn't gonna get liquored up, but I'm just gonna give you a little insight to how dumb I can be. And you better be glad nobody said amen. But they were goofy as messy bugs. Ignorant, stupid. Right now, if I caught a bunch of them doing it, I'd take my belt off, whoop every one of them. But let me tell you something. I ain't never been drunk. I ain't never had a drink. But I'm unhappy and not proud to tell you that I can act drunk. <laughs> Until it came down, Brother David, to getting in trouble. And guess what? Not no more. No. Walking all crazy, dying, laughing, you know, because a bird flew and landed in the middle of the road or some kind of goofy thing. I remember the whole group, and I can name who they were. I remember, well, we were on our way to the carnival, and they were all goofy and acting crazy. And, and you know, they may have been putting on too. Who knows how much how much they'd even drank. But, but uh, I walked along with them, and, and I, I, I had to fit in. So I started acting goofy too. We call it acceptance. We call it peer pressure. Or any number of the common colloquialisms that we'll give it. But they all end up at the same place. People want friends. The need for companionship is something that in fact we share with God. He was aware that Adam was alone. And that that wasn't a good thing. And so he made Eve... God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the day that He busted them out for sin, as He was known to do. But Brother McKinney, He wasn't there hunting for somebody that had done wrong. He wasn't there hunting for somebody to discipline Brother David. He was there because He wanted companionship. He wanted friendship. He desired to be with them in the garden in the cool of the day. They were His creation created for the purpose of being in relationship with God. Granted, the nearest thing, and I need you to understand this, the nearest thing that we can experience to the relationship God desires to have with us is marriage. The true idea of marriage, not what society sells you is the idea of marriage. But a marriage between a man and a woman is the very closest a human being can get to the relationship between God and man. And we can make a strong argument that the basis for a strong marriage is as much friendship as it is anything else. You need to be friends with your husband or your wife. You need to have friendly conversation with your husband and wife. So understand the concept of friendship is a refrain found throughout Scripture. The Lord spoke to Moses. I thought this was ironic as I read in the book of Exodus 33, I believe it is. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face, the Bible says, as a man speaks to his friend. Abraham was called the friend of God. And we wouldn't have to stretch things to declare David as a friend of God, seeing he was identified as a man after God's own heart. Then with the revelation of Jesus Christ and, and very shortly after He burst forth on the scene and as, as, a, as a minister, as a Bible adult uh, with a message of repentance, uh, uh, He chose Him twelve disciples and, and He surrounded Himself with friends as He called them in the book of John. He said, you're no more servants but you're friends because I'm going to share everything with you. We are in fact referred to as friends of Jesus as He laid down His life for us. And, and of course our friendship is assured. He said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. 
in our text, Proverbs 18 and 24. And I will tell you today that I'm hopefully going to peel back some layers of this, this verse or this, this particular passage that we may not have viewed before. But the Bible said, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. First thing we have is we've got a man that has friends. He's not trying to get them. He has them. But to be a friend and to keep friends by definition, he must show himself friendly or basically act like a friend. So the consequence of having friends is you have to be friendly. But there is a clear line of demarcation drawn between a man that has friends must show himself friendly. Because then it says, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now, before we get too carried away in ascertaining what that means, we got to understand that the first clause and the second clause are talking about two different things. The first clause is talking about a group of friends or a crowd of friends or, or quite a number of friends and, and a man is, has a requirement to, when he has a group of friends to act friendly toward them. But it is a, a trivial, it is a, a peripheral uh, relationship. But the Bible says there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It's a friend that passes the bonds of family. That will drop everything to help a friend. Despite, and, I, and this has been evident in my own life, despite maybe there being several years between you being together with your friend, but as soon as you get back together, it's as if you've never been apart. The beautiful thing, Brother Larry, to that is, is nobody has to remind you to be happy to see them. But it's a natural occurrence. And, and a beautiful thing about it is there's no pressure. There's no expectation. I don't hug them because I think they want to. I hug them because I know they want to. Think about it as you come back together with a, a close friend. The, pre the lack of pressure, the lack of expectation. There's no guards that I have to put in place. I don't have to protect myself. And definitely there's no guile, there's no fakeness, there's no falsehood. But it's an air of expectancy at a reunion. A long, strong hug, an unprovoked smile. It's a joyous occasion or coming together. As I wrote this, I thought of my few friends that fit this bill, and I am blessed and that I do have several different locations, different places, different walks of life. But when I run into them, even here in town, run into them at Walmart, or if I, if I run into them at a family reunion, or maybe some far off place, uh, it's as if we were never apart. And, the, and, and that affection, that mutual friendship is evident. I had somebody tell me one time, he... Uh, he said, G.L., you tell more people you love them than anybody ever heard in my life. Because virtually everybody I talk to on the phone of any, any time, I tell them that I love them. But as I wrote this, I thought of my few friends that fit this bill. But then I, I, was, I was troubled. Because I thought just as profoundly how it seemed I was writing something of a history lesson. Rather than something that might happen now. What has happened to friendship? There's no such thing as a convenient friend. So many of us have given up on having those friendships. We are content with acquaintances, but we lack the commitment for true friendship. My heart screams at this travesty. Because as I, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, because as I look back down my life, there are so many occurrences. Yes, I had a big family and I had a blessed family. But there's so many things that when I think of an instance, when I think of it happening, when I go over it in my mind, there was always a friend that was there with me. 
I think about doing the different things that I did. I think about reading the stories that I read. It was even more of a culture thing. Come on, who's never heard of high old silver and away? And he was never away by himself. But always Tonto riding beside him. There was Batman and Robin. There was Tom and Jerry. And I know that you, it seemed like that they were always at one another, but they were friends. My heart screams at the travesty as, as the Lord has been shaking and rattling my cage uh, and recognizing that this apathetic outlook toward friendship has crept into the church. We are so much better when we have friends. We are stronger. We are more friendly. We are more approachable. Think about it right after you reconnect with a close friend and you walk arm in arm or maybe arms around each other to sit down to have a bite to eat and you don't, don't snap at the waitress and you don't gripe and bellyache about the food. It doesn't even matter because everything has become secondary to that friendship. Please hang with me for just a few minutes if you will. I won't keep you long this morning. We're so much better when we have friends. If anybody anywhere should embrace the idea of deep-rooted friendships, it should be the church. We act as if we need to wait to heaven to begin to bond. And the question is why? Jesus Himself valued friendship, especially that of His disciples. John chapter number 6, verse 66. From that time, many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. From that time, I'm gonna. This is gonna make sense. It's gonna make sense. If it don't, you're gonna be well prepared for your afternoon nap. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You have to understand, we're very early in Jesus' ministry. And he came out of the gate, and everybody flocked to him. Everybody thronged him. Everybody wanted to be around him. It was cool to be around Jesus. But then Sister Leanne, it ceased to be about the benefits of being around Him. And He began to open them up to the commitment of being around Him. You read, excuse me, read John chapter number 6. And you can see, they, nobody left until He started talking about commitment. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, verse 67, Will you also go away? Now, I don't know about you, but I really like this passage and I have discussed it because I see, I see a, a vulnerability in Jesus that's also in me. Now we like to be tough, we like to be cool, and, and we like to lift our head up and, and stick our chest out and act as if we don't need anybody. That's the way of the world. But the truth of the matter is, we desire friendship from the time we're little bitty. But then when we're filled with the Holy Ghost, we are opened up to a whole new arena of friendship. But our attitude and our actions regarding our friends in the world has manifested itself in our relationship with God because ain't nobody ever seen Him. Nobody's ever seen the Lord. Everything, every facet of my relationship with God is built by faith. Right? So the way... Think about this. When the Apostle Paul is preaching and talking about a relationship with God, he uses the, the metaphor of a runner. He uses the metaphor of a fighter. He uses the metaphor of an apprentice that's, that's tied himself to a master. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ Himself used the metaphor of an ox being yoked together. We have got to understand that the things that are around us is what we acquaint to our relationship with God. Now I told you, I told you I was scared to talk about this, partly because it's slow moving. 
That's why I tried to get everybody cranked up earlier. Uh, yeah, I feel pretty loaded up this morning, so, uh, you know, 20 minutes into worship, half of us were already sitting down. 20 minutes. I'm going to be watching you on Black Friday. <laughs> we're standing in line for a baby doll. Yeah, I ain't no hypocrite either. I ain't never been to Black Friday and I ain't going. But I've stood in Walmart and talked to some of you longer than 20 minutes. Stood talking. You know what's going on in here? There ain't nothing in your life, nothing in your life that can affect you more powerfully than what's taking place from 10 to 12 right here. Right here. I understand if you have physical issues and if you're, if you're a, a, an elder, you've earned the right to sit there the whole service if you want to, and I will be happy for you to do it. But we've got to realize something. There's, this is not just about this walk with God, this relationship with God is not just about what He can give me. Right. This ain't just about... Uh, you. When you have a relationship, uh, when it's all about what somebody can give you, you're not a friend, you're a parasite. And you're going to suck everything out of them, and when they got nothing left to give, then you're going to go somewhere else. But when you have a friendship, it is a mutual relationship, and we've got to grasp a hold that the Lord needs something from us just as badly as we need something from Him. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost up in here right now. But our ideology and our mentality about friendship that we have in the world, and some of us don't even have a friend anymore. And gripe and belly ache and moan. I need more friends. I need more fellowship. But don't nobody want to be around me. They may not be the problem. When you've got a true friend, when you've got a close friend, you want to be around them. And you will make allowances and you will inconvenience yourself. I have some close friends that I could call them at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and say I'm broke down on the side of the road. You know something, Joe? They would be there. Now I've got some friends. I've got some friends. They wouldn't be there. They ain't my friend. Wake up. Coffee's on. And the preacher is shelling down the corn. We are in a relationship with God. And it is a friend-based relationship. But if we've got a skewed ideology of what a friend is, our relationship right here will be messed up, and so will this one. He came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Brother David, think about this. They would have been thrilled to death if he never came back. Say, how do I know that? Because when he came walking, Adam! At their normal meeting spot, they wasn't there. Many of his disciples went back. They left. When Jesus began to ramp up the commitment of what it's going to take to be a part of the kingdom, what it's going to take to, to follow him, he did tell his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. And he began to ramp up the commitment of what it was going to take. It's going to take some denying of yourself. It's going to take some hard work and some effort on your own. It's going to take some sacrifice to be with me. Come on, you know what he said? Lord, we want to go where you live. He said, you got to understand something. The foxes have a hole and the bird got a nest. But you come... And... You're coming after me as long as the fishes and the loaves don't run out. 
But the Lord is looking for some people that ain't in it for the fishes and the loaves. The Lord is looking for some people that are in it because we're friends. And as much as I need Him, and as much as I'm counting on Him, He's also counting on me to be there. What is it that makes us hide? It's sin. It's self selfishness, self-centeredness that makes us hide from the Lord. But when we are stripped away from our facade and recognize when I come, why do you think David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord? Because it was